Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony, and joining me, as always, the Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. How are things? Uh, things are pretty good. You know, a few years ago, I started saying the word man, ironically. Like, yeah, man, <laughs> so cool, man, that's groovy, man. And I started saying it so much, I now, it's 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 become a tick, it's become a habit. So I'm saying, uh-huh. whoa, man, all the time, sincerely. Uh-huh. So all besides right. that, I'm doing fairly well. All right, G- good story. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, um, we have a, an interesting show for you today, uh, a person that I have been following for some time and uh, I've read a number of his books. Uh, it is Gordon White and he is the host of the Rune Soup podcast and the author of several very interesting books. Gordon, hello and welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. So um, the, the, our non-traditional first question, and I'm sure nobody has ever asked you this before, were you a weird kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get I get asked that a bit, uh, unsurprisingly, you know. Um, yeah, I made my own bed there. <laughs> you sure uh, yeah, probably. So I was certainly precocious uh, in the sense of um, hitting milestones early, like reading and speaking and so on, which meant, although I didn't understand the majority of it, I would I'd read Lord of the Rings at six and so on. So there was always a um, an interest in imaginal adult worlds, I guess, from an early age. Uh, some odd experiences as a child um, that are the kind of things I hope to hear on my show. Uh, some really terrifying regular uh, sleep paralysis incidents that are called across different parts of Fortiana, things like hag attacks and so on, and and potentially some nightmares that may or may not have been screen memories for other sort of entity encounters. So that was um, that was the the weird part of the childhood, which was otherwise fairly idyllic, frankly. I grew up in uh, regional Australia um, in a coastal town. So, you know, it's warm and there are beaches and and that kind of stuff. It wasn't um, the mean streets of Rio or (laughs) or something like that. Uh, But yeah, in that sense, I was odd. Uh, It was... I had singular interests... Uh, as a kid that um, weren't exactly shared. And this is obviously pre-internet, so uh, that gets um, very isolating when you're already quite isolated. Mm -hmm. Yes, my own um, uh, experience growing up in suburbia where the local library had, I think, two Llewellyn books in it. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's a... um, I suppose the most fortunate thing for me was I did have a... When we used to have such things, uh, they are in something um, we had a remarkable independent bookstore that was probably about a four mile walk maybe a bit less down the hill from the house uh, and so I got to an age where I had a small amount of money at the same time that you could sort of walk four miles and mm. you know not get abducted or whatever <laughs> uh, so I could go in there and um, the woman who ran it um, was sort of quite I mean, she was spiritual in a way, but she was, I, I don't know, maybe a, maybe an emissary from the higher powers because she could see what your interests were and could kind of direct you into maybe maybe read this or maybe pick this up. And it was one of those just remarkable things that a, an independent bookstore that's in full flight can really do. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, I was fortunate. Um, but it also meant I was poor because I spent all my money on books <laughs> from a fairly early age. <laughs> That's something I think we can all relate to even today. Yeah, it's still, it's, yeah exactly. This is, um, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. So um, we've been doing the show for a long time. Uh, I, I guess Jonathan counted. We've been doing about 200 shows. Uh, about and 200 shows. We have never talked about chaos magic, which is actually kind of odd given our our clientele here. So um, given you've written about chaos magic, you've practiced chaos magic, can you tell the uh, viewers who may not know what it is, what what is chaos magic and... Why do you like it? Ooh, uh, why I like it. Uh, so it kind of depends what decade you're talking about because it, it, it originates more or less in uh, in both North London and North England in the 80s. Uh, and so there's the sort of original formulation of chaos magic, which I more or less stick to. Uh, and that kind of emerged. There's a whole big backstory of 
what was going on in um, British occultism at the time with, you know, essentially Thelemic lineages being cut and arguing over Kenneth Grant stuff and all this kind of just mess. And the other part of it was um, sort of washing up into Thatcher's Britain after the 70s, um, although she's a factor in the 70s too, but more in the sense of the age of Aquarius, um, lots of channel texts, kind of 70s esotericism. Mm. There was this, there's a pivot of like, there's a lot of nonsense going on. So what happens if we actually just rigorously focus on results? And the kind of, there are two baseline assumptions that emerged with the origins of chaos magic amongst the Stoke Newington sorcerers, which is in North London and so on, which is one, there might not be any ultimate truth. And two, belief can be used as a tool for um, more external transformation rather than internal. And those two things sort of iterated and, and different experiments were conducted individually and, and with groups. To, uh, and by the time you're in the 90s, there's a lot of superhero comic stuff and the Necronomicon and so on. But it was basically like, let's just see how or, or why this works. And, and since then, some of the sort of foundational assumptions I've certainly interrogated or, or made challenging because they assume a science of mind that I don't think is correct. But that's the general idea, which was, and it, it sounds, and, and this is what it sounds like from the outside, it doesn't sound like it's a particularly rigorous approach to magic. Uh, because you can theoretically swap out different things. You can invoke Captain Jack Sparrow rather than a kind of comp a capricious uh, spirit of Mercury, for instance. Um, but And that's fine. That's technically true. That's the first half of it. But the second half of it is the bit that everyone misses, which is if you don't get results, you've, done, you've just made garbage. And mm. that is still missing from, I would say, the kind of competing 20th century schools. It's less relevant to where, uh, I guess, the magical discourse has been in the last 10 years. But if you look at the 20th century schools, which would include um, magically operant versions of neo-paganism, uh, various Golden Dawn survivals and Thelema and so on, that bit is missing. Uh, and that bit's really hard. So it's actually quite a vigorous school. But anyway, it sort of began with a couple of um, Pete Carroll and, and Ray Sherwin's books. They're two-thirds of the people we could rightly say originated it. Uh, and then those books were picked up by Weiser and um, published in the late 80s, early 90s in the US. And it kind of got away from itself there because it showed up at the same time as the early internet. And a lot of the nonsense that is... is I, the 90s was the nonsense decade for... Uh, chaos magic in particular and the noughties were it's sort of absent decade where it was basically just me <laughs> <laughs> and uh and here we are now unfortunately i think it's it's undergone something of a renaissance because it has that uh focus on empiricism and and i do a lot of work and i'm sure you guys are interested in this kind of stuff but i do uh, a lot of work and research on the empirical evidence for psi phenomena for the empirical evidence that demonstrates that empiricism is an incomplete cosmology mm -hmm. so that empirical focus on um, results and empirical results gets caught in a really useful infinite loop now that we have all this extra data about how psi is a real thing and also um, a kind of meta-analysis of what it probably can and can't do there's something of a golden age, I would say, of, of chaos magic now, where it's it's kind of jailbroken empiricism because you can see what it can and can't do. And and one of the upshots of that is that it's kind of turned back on itself and, and interrogated those foundational assumptions. But that's essentially it. It's a it's a British school of explicitly practical magic that is um, polymorphous enough to incorporate and and sort of be run in conjunction with basically any other cosmology you want even technically although this would be silly uh, even technically astringent materialism mm. i think uh, uh you already sort of addressed this question but uh this is our sixth season of talk Gnosis. and for this season we're trying our best uh, to have an overarching theme of of practicality like what does this mm -hmm. stuff mean how do you apply it to your day-to-day -day life i'm wondering is, is chaos magic a, a chaos magic of any use for spiritual and moral development like for practical and measurable self-actualization 
The short answer is no, absolutely not. And in pieces of eight, I think that's the same for um, any practical magic. I think in many respects, it's the slowest route up the mountain. Now, I'll come back to why uh, you'll find corners of the esoteric world that would disagree with that. But the short answer is absolutely not. The longer answer is, and this is kind of something I discussed in the Chaos Protocols in the chapter called Becoming Invincible. If you embark upon a successful practical enchantment campaign, and maybe it's your first, and there's something about um, the first time you do practical enchantment that makes it work really, really well, that just knocks you back in your chair. All of a sudden, the next day and the day after that, you are living in a world that you that runs differently to what you previously thought, because now you have to incorporate the idea that magic works and magic is real. Now, I would consider that a binary spiritual step up. I think humans need to find a thing that is so astonishing in its extra dimensional or spiritual potency that it can't ever be erased or eroded by just the just by being down here right so in that respect practical enchantment in all its forms so we'll, we'll use chaos magic as one can be a almost like a, a gnostic moment of waking up to the spiritual reality of reality but otherwise, no. Otherwise, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not. And I actually, I, that's in its favor, as far as I'm concerned, because mm. it doesn't get you off the hook to interrogate and find your own morality. And, and that is, that's actually something, maybe one of the few good things. That I, I'm, I'm quite down on uh, European philosophy since Descartes, essentially. But one of the things that they may be nobly attempted to get right post Descartes instead of heading into just before the idealists, the German idealists. So in the 18th century, they're looking for whether you can build a morality based on reason, which is like, well, as we're in the process, as, as, as Nietzsche would say, 150 years later, killing God, what, what are the implications for morality on that? And that's actually a very good impulse because that's showing that you can't, you can't avoid that. You can't avoid deciding how you want to be in the world. Mm. So that's in that's in Chaos Magic's favor, but the reality is I view its spiritual antecedents to be the cunning men of, of southern England and, and people who are doing off-book grimoire magic, and, and all this kind of stuff is there to um, prevent your cattle from getting ringworm or making sure um, your daughter doesn't marry the feckless son of the um, blacksmith or, or whatever. Like, it's very specifically targeted to um, improving physical conditions. That's what it's for. Um, you can kind of pull it out into just hypothetical exploration. A lot of the grimoire stuff is done by wealthy people who don't need the money magic, mm -hmm. but they are kind of interested in what the thing is that the beings that show up in the mirror will say. So you can pull it in that direction and sort of make the case that that's part of spiritual development. It, it's also still kind of just a hobby because they didn't have TV at the time. <laughs> uh, but it, but in general, like the the antecedents to chaos magic are um, are in the fields and are about the improvement of life uh, on in the physical rather than the quest. Now the quest, why people can sometimes make the mistake that the quote unquote Western magical tradition is some sort of spiritual path is a sort of side effect of the Renaissance. So, mm -hmm. as they were bundling this stuff, as the books like the uh, Corpus Hermeticum and whatever start showing up in Florence in particular, you have the likes of Ficino and so on, essentially doing this, and uh, Ficino is a remarkable man, but essentially doing this kind of wishy-washy, trying to avoid getting burned at the pyre by the Inquisition, but still playing with this stuff, building this idea that these books represent a recovery of a complete an original spiritual belief system from the distant past that we can now sort of restore in a Christian context. And it, ha it has a Christian context in the sense of it, um, especially once you get to Pico della Mirandola, for instance, there's, he's trying to put um, Kabbalah and Hermeticism together with the idea of the incarnation of Christ. Yeah. This reaches its fulfillment point, or the, the sort of peak, uh, with Agrippa. Mm -hmm. And Agrippa genuinely believed he could... Um, all the king's horses and all the king's men this ancient high cosmology back together and mm -hmm. the books um, the three books 
to some extent the fourth, but mostly the three books of occult philosophy that Agrippa put out, uh, how it cast such a long shadow over the subsequent centuries because it was actually a very well put together book. It was easy to read, it was easy to refer to. So it has this massive impact. And as a result, it's kind of filtered into the last couple of centuries um, magical practitioners view of themselves that it is some kind of high tradition and, yes. uh, and, and it isn't it, um, that's a guess and what's fascinating about that because I wrote a book called um, Starships is mm -hmm. that there are continuities from a magic perspective that go back as far as I can tell between 70 and 150,000 years ago wow. they, the trouble is um, magic discovered that a past exists before we had history and archaeology mm -hmm. so Agrippa's past is well you know there's togas and Corinthian columns and all this kind of stuff and uh, and we've fallen away from that it's it's kind of a very Atlantean shape and we've fallen away from this uh, previous way of being peacefully one with God in in the physical and that yeah. is not a correct it's, it turns out that's not a correct read of history but it's funny because you do still smell it. Like, I get why. If you, if you do any yeah. of this stuff, Gnosticism or whatever, and Gnosticism is a good example because it's obsessed with origins, mm -hmm. um, you know that there's something to it. You're like, there, this, you have the sensation that we used to be better at this. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that doesn't mean that, you know, a, a kind of high hermetic civilization in, in the deep past that we've fallen away from and we only have fragments of. We, it's more. It's more visceral than that. You have this the sensation that we used to be better at this, and for some reason, this is the Gnostic impulse. For some reason, now we're not. Why is that? Yeah. Well, that actually uh, goes uh, really well for our next question. So, uh, Father Tony and I are both Gnostics. Us specifically, not necessarily everybody who works on the show or involved of any movements that we're involved with. Us two, we're we're big on on cosmology, right? Specifically, mm -hmm. the the Cephian cosmos that you can find in the book of Secret John in the Nag Hammadi. Sure. Um, do, you, do you have a cosmology? And if so, how do you use it? Like, we talked about the, the cosmology uh, of Secret John not just as a cool story, but we had a great show on, on applying it to meditation, right? Mm -hmm. As above, right. so below. So some of the, like, do you have a cosmos? Uh, and do, do you have practical use out of your, your cosmic model? So, to some extent, it's unavoidable. And yeah. this is in pieces of eight as well. If you don't build your own metaphysics, you are essentially using the enemies. You, yeah. If you haven't interrogated how you think reality works, um, you're getting whatever is written in the Guardian as reality, and that's <laughs> absurd. Um, so in that respect, yes, I do. As to what it looks like, uh, it is probably some sort of the universe is an evolving living organism in its entirety and and matter has an interiority and that's the that's what's been interpreted and i think one of the errors in not just gnosticism but all that kind of thinking that's going on at the time neoplatonism and hermeticism and so on is it has verticalized something that is horizontal and interior which isn't to say there isn't a hierarchy for instance um but yes i think uh, I, I wrote a post ages ago called Animism is um, the Territory, Gnosticism is the Map. And that's sort of where I'm at in terms of cosmology. Because Gnosticism does two things that I, I really like. Um, one is it carries with it a, um, a natural suspicion of authority, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, historically understandable given that it probably emerged uh, in Alexandria amongst diaspora Jews, um, dealing with the fact that um, the sort of the the top of Jewish society was complicit with Roman occupation and the second temple had just happened and, and all this kind of stuff. So you get the idea that the people in charge are either idiots or not uh, don't have your best interest at heart. And yeah. in particular when you get the um, that Alexandrian blend a lot of the so, so say for instance the 8th reveals the ninth has a whole bunch bunch of what are called um, nomina magica or barbarous names or barbarous words so mm -hmm. all those kind of goo words that are used for um, meditation that appear to be probably names of gods secret names of gods different angels and so on now that predates uh, Gnosticism and you find that in say the Greek magical py papyri which is contemporaneous mm -hmm. but what that shows is that they're they're looking to uh, 
have their own Gnostic uplifting and they're going to be using the tools that are available and, and so on. So you get, you get it in Pista Sophia, Eighth Reveals the Ninth and so on, all these words, some of which have an overlap into the Greek magical vocabulary, not many of them, stuff. but that shows what was going on at the time, which was uh, F these guys, F these guys in their temple and their empire. Um, and, and I like that, so that's the first thing I like. Um, which is why I think Gnosticism is a very good map for now, because you kind of have the default position that they are always lying to you, <laughs> or they absolutely don't have your best interest at heart. Yeah. And the other one, I said this ages ago, and it, I, I wish I remembered where, because it might be accidentally really true. <laughs> um, Graham Hancock says humans are species with Asia, but I think from a Gnostic perspective, we're a species with a hangover, because it comes <laughs> back to that we used to know this. Like, I rem the story of my origin is wrong, and I feel it, and I must go and find out. Hence their yep. obsession with Genesis, and, and, and this is why you know, I know that, the, I, as far as I'm concerned, the debate is settled, but I think it is a Jewish uh, cult or collection of cults originally, because no one else gave a crap about Genesis, other than Jews, obviously. Yeah, we're, uh, we're and, in agreement there. Yeah, so I can, yeah, uh, yeah. So, that, you have to go and find out how this all happened because what I've been told is a crook and and it's so fascinating to think if that had happened now and to some to some extent it did it would look more like um, research stuff I, I'm very interested in and have on the show research into ancient viruses and and directed panspermia and and the actual formation of the human body because it doesn't quite work in official evolution and so on so our version of that they didn't have any of that stuff what they had was revealed texts of the origin of themselves in the universe, but they approached it with the same and suspicion and willingness to performatively find out, and that is why I will always love the Gnostics. And you guys talking about Sethianism, like that's a good example of it. Like trying to find out how all this happened, and it means that I think the most Gnostic film ever is Dude, Where's My Car? Because you start from a moment of lack of memory, and you're aware that the story is going to be weird. Uh, you, that's your only sensation like what happened last night the story's going to be weird and you gradually pick up pieces and flashes and it turns out it is weird it turns out it's a really really strange story and for me those two bits are synopsis that I retain whilst living in I guess you would say an animist universe and that's probably my cosmology today Friday morning in Tasmania yeah um, well, I've got to say, uh, the Father's been running a, an ongoing list of Gnostic movies, so I'm not sure, uh, which I believe is still online, so yeah. I don't think we have Dude, Where's My Car on there. So there I go. don't think I've heard it's, that before. Yeah, no, that's, It's yeah. so offensive because it's such a dreadful movie. Like, there are, there are many <laughs> great Gnostic movies, right? But uh, it's such a dreadful film. But it, nevertheless, you, you, you will, if you try to replace it with something, you won't find anything that has... has and the yeah, impulse and need to go backwards and find out and the story getting weirder and weirder and weirder. So uh, I, I, no, I, delight in, I delight in how dreadful the film is um, as a sort of um, gloss or example of what I find so inspiring about the Gnostic impulse because it is dreadful but, and there are plenty of good ones um, otherwise, but there you go. Well, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, Ashton Kutcher is the Hierophant we deserve. Yeah. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's riff on that actually for a minute. So, we and as Gnostics in our in our cosmologies that the, that we talk about, that we have various um, different spiritual beings, um, mm -hmm. or one might argue not spiritual beings but soul beings, if you want to get pedantic about it. And I do. Um, the 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 idea that these beings. Um, exist and they have uh, a role to play in the universe and um i i see more and more people coming around to the idea that this might be more literally true than uh mm. literary <laughs> um yeah. and i i see kind of the resurgence of the of the spirit model um contributing in, in large part to that um where do you I mean, you talk a lot about spirits and, and the spirit model and animism. Um, how, where do you view, how do you view these 
entities are they are they really real or are they a different kind of real or are they convenient metaphors or all three um they broke up a little bit but i oh, think okay. you're asking um yeah, yeah yeah i think you're asking what am the archons yeah and you know cool. spirits in general all right um, yeah, the spirit model, this is one of those things coming back to um, chaos magic and the inevitabilities of actually getting empiricism and, and research correct is that uh, it's it's the best match. And this is obviously something Jung famously said to Freud um, in the early 20th century, that if you look at the different interpretations versus the impact in the world, you can't avoid the fact that the sort of separate ontology of spirits is, is the best model and we have that we have that with uh we have greater evidence for that in the 21st century than we've had for a long time so we've got near-death experience research after death communication we've got less insane or shall we say more sane interpretations of ufo contact experiences and, and, and bringing in alignment with the I hate the word folklore, but like the the folklore of, in particular, European history. But then looking at that around the world, dragons in China is the is actually Dr. Jacques Vallée's favorite. So you're kind of left with the um, parsimony requires you to assert that spirits have some separate existence, which is good, I think, for the West because it brings us back into alignment with the rest of the planet's worldviews and also our own up until a couple of centuries ago. So in that sense, well, that's a really step. And one of the, the premium members at RuneSoup.com and I are interrogating is, are we bringing too much of that Neoplatonic dualism and Cartesian split to what we mean about spirits when we talk about them? And probably the answer is yes. So the next step in the spirit model is to kind of see what it looks like in a, in a um, animist epistemology, because if you look in the Amazon, for instance, we have physical and non-physical as the divide between what a spirit is versus not. So a spirit is a non-physical entity. Well, the trouble with that is sometimes it isn't. And when we go there, Rosemary will both be a spirit and has a spirit. Like, how does that work if you're not doing this sort of um, empty matter or empty material that is then um, enhaunted with, <laughs> with a spirit? And they cut the divide instead of physical, non-physical as visible, non-visible. It's a very perspectivist uh, mythology, which allows um, for, depending on how you are from a state of consciousness perspective or just being a normal human, Rosemary's spirit is Rosemary. We were looking at a angel is looking at it. They'll see Rosemary's spirit. And it's all about visible, non-visible, depending on where you are. So the spirit model is the best. Uh, now we need to interrogate what we mean by spirit to get the model to really fly, and that's kind of where we are. Um, as for the archons, I don't see how you can operate in the world today without a, coming back to cosmology, without a cosmology that incorporates, you might you might as well say demons in, in some way, shape, or form. You can't understand... Um, the impulse to drone strike your many children, you can't um, just using human uh, psychology. The, op the idea in some way that there are other beings that delight in our destruction and pain and, and feed off it, which is in fact what some demons do. Like They delight in causing pain because it is their food. So the Archons have the Archons are kind of more sophisticated or more attenuated, I guess is a better word in a way, understanding of that. Because obviously, as you know, the Greek word just means boss. So it's a way of, and this is what I like about it, it's a way of looking at the modern world or their world, which was sort of like late stage Roman Empire, where you're, if you're in the territories, in particular, if you're in um, Egypt, all the governors are Roman. There are no, in, there are no Jews running the place and there are no indigenous uh, Egyptians running. It. So you actually have an alien law um, controlling your world quite brutally. Uh, and so it's, it allows you to think with the idea that there are um, beings that do not have our best interest at heart that may well be part of the, the natural functioning of the universe. And I'll come back to that. And that 
that is your baseline or that is at least your first step for thinking with the contemporary politics of your day and so yeah. the sort of iconic model is still multiple sophisticated so yeah i assert the archons are both absolutely real and also an exceptional idea even if they weren't for uh positioning yourself in relation to uh, economic and, and political realities. Now, when it, when we talk about demons in a wider sense, if you look at the uh, expressions of, say, sub-Saharan African uh, cosmologies, which uh, which have certainly developed over the eighty thousand years that they've been running, but have also retained a lot uh, from eighty thousand years ago. So this is a bit about what starships and a couple of presentations I gave in London were about. Um, we have to be careful with it, and you sort of got to put the put the flag or, or or hang a light on the fact that you're not doing a noble savage thing or assuming that these cultures are unchanged over such a long amount of time. There are things that they appear to have retained based on archaeological evidence, and one of them is elf shot. One of them is if you are as you are operating in the world, there are spirits at the edge of the campfire that will. Um, elf shoot you like so little blow darts and and whatever and that causes um disease that can cause family calamity that just the reality of the universe is that the spirit world is awash with beings that don't have our best interest at heart and that appears to be a long-lived human observation and we see that expressed specifically in gnosticism as a kind of archonic uh, demiurgic model yeah. I, and again, that that feeds right into into the next question. You actually used a phrase "black iron prison" in in your mm. writing, right? It pops up uh, in chaos protocols and other places. What what do you mean by that phrase when you use it? Well, basically the same as um, Philip K. Dick did when he used it, because that's where I got it from. Uh, it's it's that kind of creeping Gnostic realization that, however much, and the universe, and this is in Gnosticism, and people miss it. The universe is actually fundamentally benign. It's just that our experience of it or how we are embodied and, and where we are in, in time and space makes that difficult to see. And this is where it gets weird. It is specifically engineered to make it difficult to see. <laughs> so the black iron prison is what Philip K. Dick referred to as the... Um, and he sort of said you have to recognize the bars first, hence the name of the chapter. Uh, if you look at how the modern world in particular is arranged, although this would have held for the classical world too, um, you just think it's reality until you realize that the political system is structured to actually um, minimize your impact on it, and the economic system is structured to extract from you. And yeah. um, the, sort of, the system of truth validation from an argument from authority perspective, so be it priests or be it Richard Dawkins or whatever, um, is designed to separate you from finding that inner divinity. And, and you just kind of, it, it's this gradual becoming visible of what he called the black eye in prison, which is these things that keep us uh, trapped and, and away from our, uh, our true self in, in some sense. So that's what the black eye in prison is. And the Gnostics obviously uh, sort of own the podium in in describing how that works in terms of uh, the Western tradition, you won't get uh, better ex to the point where they were potentially overly obsessed with it, but you won't get better a better execution or ex uh, exploration of the fact that it is curious that wherever you are in the timeline, the the challenge is always the same. It's, it's the Grant Morrison thing. There's only ever one revolution, and you, you particularly in modern America at the moment, we we know this from politics, we know this from economics. The creepier ones are now food and healthcare, and and you look at it and go, there is an accident of history interpretation of it, but that just doesn't seem very. It doesn't. It's, it's not the best description for how complete this cage is. And this comes back to what I mean by you need a cosmology that incorporates demons. And it's so it's it's important just from a spiritual development, but it's also important if you're going to operate in parapolitical or quote-unquote conspiracy spheres, because where, and this is a broad brush statement, but where conspiracy gets things wrong is the same way materialists get things wrong, which is you can certainly look at the history of the 20th century America as just as an example, 
and realize that it has been a, a, a reformulation of the black iron cage and even a kind of dialing up of the temperature inside your cell uh, over the last 50 years. And you to find an explanation for that that is solely physical, you end up having to make sort of tenuous connections between a, a, um, a physical elite, an Illuminati, if you will, uh, that is kind of gradually and, and, and masterfully controlling the, the formation or the reorganization of, say, American or global society. Now, there are absolutely groups behind the curtain that are attempting to you know, um, fulfill their own agenda, multiple groups. And so this is this like, we, if conspiracy wasn't real, um, there wouldn't be about 300 laws against them on the books in the US, right? So that happens. But what when you open the when you open yourself up to the kind of spiritual interpretation, you actually don't need this shadowy, a, a continuous shadowy elite, um, always successfully moving uh, the politics and economics around to their benefit and your detriment, because that's what our cons are. They're, they're, you know, you can actually extend. If the universe is spiritual, then this is then everything is is kind of spiritual warfare. You can actually extend that analysis into the spiritual, and get not just less insane, uh, but also derive a sense of urgency for that particular spiritual quest of of waking yourself up, because. It's the only revolution, and, and as it gets hotter and hotter in the Black Iron Prison, uh, it seems to me that it becomes more urgent rather than less to do that to do that waking up. Yeah. That actually, um, it kind of reverses the, the last-minute question I added to our, our show notes document here. I, I, um, I wanted to talk to you about the, uh, the kind of reemergence of the spirit model um, as mm -hmm. a reaction to late-stage capitalism, but... Are, are you kind of saying that it's almost the other way oh, around? Oh, I think it is. No, no, no. I absolutely think it is. I think there's always uh, there's always one little light in the darkness. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I mean by the universe is fundamentally good. Mm -hmm. This is the Gnostic revelation. The universe is fundamentally good. Yeah. However, our embodied experience of it is not. Mm -hmm. uh, I harp on that and, all the time. I, I, I often tell people, you know, Gnosticism is at its core an optimistic world yeah. Um, yeah yeah absolutely. And it, but it's 100%. really hard to see that on, uh, on the outside you know like when you're no, when you just glance through the text it's like oh well why don't we all just kill ourselves you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so bad um, but like no and what's that's funny not the point. like and and people uh and i'll get to your question but i, I just want to agree and, and and pile my own complaint onto <laughs> that uh which is so the eighth reveals the ninth is actually my favorite very brief obviously gnostic text and it's like nine lines, a bit more. And if you just sit quietly and do a few deep breaths and say that out loud, come back and tell me that Gnosticism is pessimistic because it is, it is a rocket ship to that kind of, all of a sudden, much higher and, and, and love-filled um, Experience. So come back, do that, and come back and tell me it's uh, it's pessimistic, and it's the it's the outside view, and it's also the outside view of people who fail to understand that Gnosticism isn't the text. The texts are the evidence for a performative experience of mm -hmm. spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a, there's a double error there. But the um, the spirit model, the reemergence of the spirit model, is an inevitability. This is what I love about. Um, say Charles Fort and his different models of how the world works and he has dominance which are uh, in each era or dominant uh, things are absolutely true and what moves the dominance is all the kind of damned facts all the stuff that doesn't fit inside the current prevailing dominant or worldview uh, eventually kind of leap over the walls and, uh, and and crash it and, and it moves on to the next thing and obviously we're moving out of the dominant of science, the sort of imperial materialistic dualistic um, mid eight uh, let's do early 19th century to 1970s uh, model of it, it takes a while for them to shift but the stuff that is outside the walls as we move into what he called the dominant of wider inclusions and or the dominant of witchcraft are all these things like the 
the previous dominant of science has literally empirical evidence that invalidates itself in terms of the reality of spirits and, and, and so on. So the spirit, the reemergence of the spirit model is a kind of inevitable cosmic function. Uh, and it's always... Um, the, the black eye in prison is getting hotter and, and the bars are kind of more intense. But it's one of those curious things that the jailer doesn't re- permanently doesn't realize it's left the, the key in the lock. And you just kind of have to see that. So there's always one little light. And, uh, and I think there is something... And what's important for kind of shifting, uh, I guess, pe- spiritual people's experience of reality at the moment is to really assert that. Because materialism is wrong and and like we're in the right we have the data we're, we're in the we're one percent in the right like it's going to be mostly wrong but we're one percent in the right and they're zero percent in the right <laughs> and and it just seems to me that we kind of fall back at mid and like oh, everyone's on their own journey or has their own truth garbage uh we don't need to be there anymore like they're they're on the run they're on the back foot uh and so uh, that's what appeals to me so much about the reemergence of the spirit model it will i don't know what it will look like in a few decades time but it's it's really important to make a space for or to build a garden for that to grow and we'll see what it grows into yeah very awesome and, and father thanks for asking that question on late stage capitalism because my wife said that if I say neoliberalism or late stage capitalism again, uh, she's going to kick me out. So, uh, nice. yeah, yeah. I, just, I just walk around the house from ranting about capitalism to our cat. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I solicited some questions for, for the question list that we're, that we're using, Gordon. Uh, we, we have a lot of friends, um, uh, a lot of uh, fellow spiritual Not seekers. to brag, but we have a lot of friends. We have a lot, a lot of, of friends. friends. Yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it yeah. there. Very popular. You're very charming. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Extremely charming. Good looking. Um, it's a shirt. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, fellow esotericists, fellow magicians, uh, fellow Gnostics, right? So, and, and they're fans of yours. They love your book. They love your courses. Um, they love uh, the, your podcast. So this, this comes, this is a solicited question. And it's a multi-part question. And it's, what happens when we meditate? Why do you recommend it for magical practices? When we're meditating, do we connect with the divine? Or do we become an instrument for the divine? Or is it just for attention and focus? It's a tough one in a way. Um, <clears throat> I, again, this is the thing. Uh, empirically the evidence is in for meditation so i can actually just rest back on the chaos magic fixation with efficacy mm-hmm. and there is nothing about meditation that is bad uh it, if it was a pill it would be a miracle drug yeah. the things that it can do just in the physical so on a basic level um it doesn't matter do it right is is essentially the, the chaos magic uh, attitude to it now as to why it is a miracle pill as in are you touching god are you becoming you know a, a vessel or vehicle for it or so on i'm not entirely sure so we've been uh, i mean i am a regular meditator but in the lead up to the q3 course which is coming up in a few weeks on um, magical geography it's been here on the farm a lot more about being in place and and obviously now that it's thank god slightly warmer i can sit outside for lengths of time and and just be in space and one of the things people maybe don't think as they go into meditation is that it's a cerebral exercise because we have all this kind of mid-20th century white people interpretation of uh sort of vedic texts that that is that underpins version one of mindfulness meditation and version two is the ridiculous interpretations of it you get in silicon valley and whatever Um, uh, the kind of materialist interpretation of mindfulness meditation is just the stupidest thing i've ever heard in my life and i (laughs) anyway it seems to me it's a very embodied practice because it is breathing and sitting it is a physical practice in in a way that people think oh it's just cerebral you're in your mind and it's not and i think that's where some of it's um, some of its efficacy, or maybe even the majority of it, is it's it's a resituating of yourself bodily in in time and space, and being able to kind of 
um, dissociate from the storm by just kind of being in, in time and place, and that has a cascade effect. There's a number of reasons why that might be the case, literally just speculations and so on. But if you can tell the difference, perhaps, between random thoughts and emotions that just kind of wall through your mind uh, and genuine spirit contact uh, and so on, like you, you become... You become a phone that isn't covered in human feces because you're getting cleaner and cleaner and things want to talk to you. So there is a spirit model interpretation, specifically animist interpretation of why meditation may work. Um, and again, it's a may work situation. Chaos magic just allows you to prioritize it based on its simply miraculous effects. And weirdly enough, because I did about 90 minutes of it yesterday, just plain mindfulness meditation in a couple of sessions because I'm not cool enough to do full 90 mm -hmm. minutes um, it how to describe this it felt like yeah it just felt like a it felt like the phone had been cleaned and I hadn't really got any additional kind of you know helping spirit contact or, or any of that stuff out of it but it just um it's one of those things that I don't think we've got right and, and is miraculous. And whether that, you can interpret that as being it makes you a better vessel for the divine, because that is certainly true. And you will certainly um, yell at your family less. And all that, there, there are personality uplifts that come with it. So you can say you become a vessel of the divine, but I'm not sure if it's an opening up of, like, and a cleaning of a glass vessel that is then filled with grace um, it might be but that's not my experience of it it's a really good question I, I wish I could have a kind of one sentence answer for it but I'm still meditating on meditation yeah no very groovy and if you had a one sentence uh, uh, answer then the show would be a lot shorter <laughs> yeah. uh, actually on that topic how are we doing for, for time father we're pretty good we okay. Some time. okay wonderful wonderful uh, okay, this is another question uh, submitted by Bishop Laney Peterson, and she asks, how can a mere mortal, read someone who doesn't have a lot of money, manage to manifest prosperity in unjust or poorly constructed economic systems, right? Um, <coughs> how can spirits make me rich? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I get the question. In a funny way, it's, um, in a funny way, they're two separate things. I mean, your, yep. your starting point is your starting point. And so you can't you can't do that as a universal. You might have grown up on the streets, or you might have grown up in um, comparative poverty in in the first world, which although is challenging and has long term effects on your sense of self and your health. And you know, um, poor people die fifteen years you know before uh, people who grew up middle class or above, right? Yeah. So you kind of can't universalize it, but what you can do is for step one, um, remove that sense of lack. Uh, in the back of your head, which is like, well, I'm poor, how can I get rich? Um, c excise that first part of the sentence as step one. And this isn't some kind of 70s think and grow rich kind of nonsense. It's um, That's a very specific magical goal because you're going to be reformulating the physical or, or reality with your mind. So you just have to find a way to cut that off. The next thing you need to do, and this is a big part of what Chaos Protocols is about, is... Um, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis and risk assessment of where your situation is, where your upsides are, and, and where they aren't, because it's tough. It's really, really, really hard. Let's not pretend that all you need to do is wish for money and, and you get, you know, we were talking about Elon Musk earlier, you get a Tesla. Like, nope. Uh, but you, the only universals are those kind of steps of going like, well, where are my upsides? Where are my downsides? Where are my costs? And radically reduce them. And, and I talk about multi-occupancy dwellings and, and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Like, you need to radically reduce them. Uh, and pe this is when the rubber meets the road for people who are ambitious when it comes to, to magic or having... And uh, many people aren't. And, and having, like, a, uh, a physically interesting incarnation. Because yeah. if you tell them that, and they go, ah, like, okay... <laughs> <laughs> um, cut your Netflix, cut your Spotify, uh, move into a share house, do all this kind of stuff, because the reality is you are making 10% below average wage, you live in an area that has, um, you know, rental 
growth is this much or rental increases are this much, can your skills be moved to another part of the country or world where you'll be making the same but your costs will be less? And you kind of go down this list and all of a sudden people suddenly realize, I was kind of hoping you would say invoke boon and uh, and I'd be rich. And uh, that's not how the black eye in prison works. So. Yeah. It starts with a head game, and then it starts with stuff that makes people uncomfortable, which is yep. that cost-benefit risk analysis. And, and all of a sudden, these targets, from a magical perspective, and in particular, sigil magic perspective, all of a sudden, these targets open up to you, dozens of them, about yep. what you can and can't do. And then you just begin the campaign, and, uh, and you might die on that campaign. And there are no guarantees that you will... Here's, here's the one guarantee. I guarantee if you just call up Boone in a couple of minutes and wish for it, nothing will happen. <laughs> and the only guarantee I can give you with a kind of uh, risk cost-benefit risk assessment analysis in, say, a sigil campaign, the only guarantee I can give you is it won't work. Uh, <laughs> it might fulfill itself in the way you expected, but that's how. Um, you are still, you're, um, funny enough, meditation helps for this. You're a divine being that can work wonders. Uh, yep. Step one, get your head in the game. Step two, look at the game. Step three, be honest. Step four, in shot. Yep. Yeah, we had. Uh, I mean, many years ago when I was uh, when I was doing this out of New York, we had uh, Jason Miller on to talk about um, his book, Financial Sorcery, and he said the same thing. And the comments on the video <laughs> from back then was like, "What? What do you mean I have to like, you know, do all this mundane stuff? I came here for magic." <laughs> Yeah, I I'm not even so. This my my medicine is not even that mundane. Like it is pretty radical in the sense that um, culture expects you to live a life. This is a black eye in prison observation. Mm -hmm. a, a life that is not set up for you. Yeah. So if you look at the mid twenty, particularly the American experience. If you look at the mid twentieth century. Uh, after the war, uh, the U.S. had 70% of global GDP. It had all the oil, all its all well access to all the oil, all the gold. All its industrial competitors were in ruins, uh, and so you ha and you have this hyper growth as it converts a war economy into an industrial economy, and and paid good wages because let's be honest, it kept uh, women and non-whites out for <laughs> for a long while. But as a result, um, there was a it was a guess that you could keep three household solvent at the one time which nowhere else in the world does and we never used to do which is sort of like um the grandparents parents and and kids reaching adult age and so we have this idea and, and houses have gotten bigger and bigger in the suburbs and have fewer and fewer people in them and they cost more and more and you get more and more into debt and it's radical to turn around and go do you know what particularly in in if you can find a way to live in a part of the United States that is on its, hasn't quite recovered from 2007, 2008, which means you sort of have lower cost, lower entry cost into a large suburban area. All of us move more than one person into it for a start, have multi-generational living, particularly if it's family or friends, and there's childcare taken care of, start growing food, look at these kind of, and it's a better way to live and it reduces your costs by, and reduces your risk of calamity or to calamity tremendously if you can have multiple um, into a house so have taken, you're at least taking steps to assert sovereignty over your own food and medicine then consider consider how you've managed for risks that happen to us down here so you're in a car accident you can't get to work and, and all this kind of all the ruinous things particularly in the US and from a healthcare perspective that can happen this is the kind of honesty you need to look at people want People want a world that probably never existed uh, mm -hmm. and definitely doesn't exist anymore. They're like, oh, I just want, um, you know, I want a rapper's house in, in the Hollywood <laughs> Hills. Uh, let me tell you how much debt they're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, definitely. Taking applications now for the Talknosis commune. So uh, <laughs> put, a, put, put, your, uh, com your, put your credit card information in I, the I comments. I want to see that happen. I, I, don't, I don't think it's... Um, given the state of the world, I don't think it's strategically useful for everyone to kind of, you know, do the Osho thing or you'll get the Osho results. But I do think, uh, and I mentioned this on Greg Carwood's show recently, uh, Higher Side Chats, I do want to see like a million little Rivendells 
um, you you can live with friends or close family of close friends or family in these sort of dwellings and be in this kind of decentralized uh, connections of shared interest and, and shared way of being the world in between the increasing bars on the iron prison from a regulatory perspective where in some states you'll go to prison for doing rainwater harvesting off your own roof and all this kind of stuff which is disastrous like this is these are awful totalitarian things but you can kind of duck around the reason these these bars are coming down is because these options are available to you and it's that kind of assessment of what's good and what's bad and what we can and what we can't do and and just leaning into the things we can and uh and that's sort of how we that's yeah that's what i would like to see rather than a commune i would like to see a uh a decentralized almost collection of terrorist rivendell cells <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we should probably wrap up. We're getting close to time here. Jonathan, why don't you uh, uh, you finish up with this last question here? I like this one. Sure. Uh, Gordon, what do you consider a, like a mind-blowing piece of occult art? could be a movie, a book, music, anything. Can't be Dude, Where's My Car? You already used that one. Yeah, uh, I already used Dude, Where's yeah. My Car? Well, so I kind of want to just do actual art for that and say um, the all the, the collected work of Paul Lafole, who I got to meet, in in london before he died and if you are looking for a extremely visionary and optimistic and um profound mind-blowing i guess artist and 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 body of work it's his because you can just sit there with these kind of visionary diagrams for uh, impossible machines and connections between Earth and the near solar system and all this kind of stuff and his his use of color and geometry and so on you can sit looking at one of them for hours and uh, and you will start having your own thoughts and, and this kind of leads to my second choice because I was almost tempted to go um, actual art actual book, actual movie and maybe mm -hmm. I will from a book perspective uh if you if you want your mind blown and it's it's half art half not um jung's red book so if you get a copy of jung's red book and you understand the context of of how he did that and why he kept it secret and so on and you read through his process of active imagination and you read through his encounters in his own own mind quote unquote um it's it's you might you can call it the spirit world or astral or whatever you want um that's an astonishing document that is the kind of like western magical text for the 20th century it's not the book of the law it's not any of that stuff it's jung's red book so and weirdly they kind of work in the same way if you look at the art that he created um and and paul lafole didn't realize he was doing the same thing having I mean, he was a ufo experiencer he actually had implants and and those in alien implants that his dentist had to take out that shouldn't have been there uh so he was a proper experiencer and his way of dealing with it was making this astonishing art uh, and that's a place to that's very much my aesthetic that kind of stuff so those two would be my mind blowing um, art pieces I guess um, films more challenging and uh, there's films I like Cloud Atlas is the best depiction of my morality probably we were talking about that earlier so I adore that one for instance but um, it is a uh, I don't want to say it's a patchy piece of art, but it's it's. I like films that are messy around the edges, and that certainly was one. Um, but yeah, those those can, those those can be three: one book, one artist, one film. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much once again for your time, Gordon. Uh, lovely to chat with you, and I, I hope we can do it again soon because there's so much that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Sounds great. Thank you very much. All right, and for those of you uh, listening or watching along at home, we'll see you next time. Next time.